last time we've introduced these uh, three components, namely the ambient space. And in this case, it will be a set which contains the objects that we are interested in, the portions of the ambient space, and this will be a semi-ring, a ring, algebra, or a sigma algebra on the ambient space or on the set X. And now we start with the discussion of the numerical measure. Then this will be a non-negative function on the semi-ring, the ring, the algebra, or the sigma algebra on X that we are taking into account. As we might know, for instance, in the case of the ring, this is close under set differences, unions, and intersections. And as in the example of counting marbles, for instance, if you want to, uh, if we know how to count the uh, two portions of uh, a set of marbles, then at least in principle, we should also count the combination, the set common to the two portions, and then uh, the set by uh, subtracting one set from the other set. These are functions will be called contents pre-measures and measures, depending on the properties which uh, uh, they satisfy and on the collection of subsets wherein these functions are defined. So first, we uh, start with a semi-ring H on a set X, then a function mu on this semi-ring. So it takes a set in the semi-ring and uh, the value would be a non-negative extended real valued uh, number. So in this case, we allow uh, that the value would be uh, infinity. Well, in terms, for example, uh, of the cardinality of set, uh, in the case of uh, infinite set, we will have an infinite uh, cardinality. So the value infinity is allowed for this function. First, it's called additive. If you have a pairwise disjoint collection of sets, say A sub J, J from one to N, and uh, the union is also in H. Well, we need to impose this because in general, a summary is not close in the union. Okay, provided that the union is in H, then mu of the union, must be equal to the sum of the function values of the sets under mu. So if we think about uh, sets, for instance, and uh, let's say number of elements or the area, then this coincides with our intuition that, let's say if I have three disjoint sets here, then uh, counting the number of elements of the union must be the same as the sum of the elements. Now, we say that uh, the uh, function mu is sub-additive if, okay, here we uh, ignore the condition that the sets are pairwise disjoint. So consider a finite sequence of elements in the semi-ring having a union also in the semi-ring. Then the value of the union under the function mu is less than or possibly equal to the sum of the uh, values. In terms of cardinality, you can think of this as follows. So if you have, let's say, two sets, A1 and A2, if you take the number of elements of the union, then that is less than the sum of the number of elements because 
the intersection here has been counted twice. And that is sub additivity. We have the countable versions of these uh, definitions. So we say that mu is sigma additive if we have, uh, let's say, a countable collection of subsets in H that are pairwise disjoint, having a union in H. So let's correct this one. So having a union in H, then the value of the union under the function mu must be equal to the sum, or here in this case, the infinite series corresponding to mu of A sub J, J from one up to infinity. So this is the uh, infinite or countably infinite uh, version of additivity. Sigma sub additivity is quite uh, somewhat different from sub additivity. So in this case, suppose that you have a sequence of elements in the summary. Okay, now the index here starts with zero to which the first set A sub zero is contained in the union of the other sets from one to infinity. Then the value of the first set A naught under mu is less than or equal to the infinite sum or the series of the uh, values of the a sub j's j from 1 to infinity under the function mu. Well, uh, if you add, to connect this to sub-additivity, if you add, let's say, the condition that uh, the sum or the union is in the semi-ring, then you can take this as your a naught, and you will have an analogous definition as with sub additivity, but now n is replaced by uh, infinity. And finally, monotonicity. So mu is said to be monotonic if you have uh, two sets in the summary, and say a is smaller than b then uh, the number or the mu of a is less than or equal to mu of b, which uh, means that if uh, you have uh, a larger set, then the value or the number of elements is possibly larger than the smaller set. So these are um, the definitions for mu having these properties. So, Now, what do we mean by a content? So a function mu from uh, a semi-ring H into the set of non-negative extended real numbers, zero to infinity, inclusive of zero and infinity. It is called a content if we have the following uh, conditions. So mu of uh, the empty set must be zero. Of course, a semi-ring contains uh, the null set or the empty set. Uh, so therefore, we can uh, apply uh, the empty set as an argument to mu. And it is uh, additive. So a content is an additive uh, function on the semi-ring to which the value of the empty set with respect to the content is zero. And in this case, the triple consisting of the set X, the summary H on X, and a content on X will be called a content space. So therefore, a content space is nothing but a triple consisting of these components.
On the other hand, it will be called a pre-measure if we replace the additivity by sigma additivity. And in this way, if mu is a pre-measure, we shall call the triple uh, the set x, the semi-ring h, and the pre-measure mu. This triple will be called a pre-measure space. One can show that uh, these two conditions here implies these two conditions in the definition of a content. So in other words, a pre-measure is also a content since sigma additivity and the fact that uh, the pre-measure of the null set is zero, this will imply that the pre-measure is also additive. This can be seen by taking uh, the components of the, of the countable collection to be empty except for a finite number of sets. So in other words, if you take, uh, let's say, the measure or the pre-measure of the union, and let us write it here. So a pre-measure is a content. For this, you just need to take, uh, let's say, a sub k to be empty for all k greater than n. And uh, the countable union will reduce to a finite union, and uh, the infinite series will reduce to a finite sum. Okay, some definitions. A content space will be uh, said to be finite if the value of the content of any element in the semi-ring is finite. So from the word itself, uh, a content will be called finite if it does not take the value of infinity. It is said to be sigma finite if One can find a countable sequence of elements in the summary for which X would be the union and the content of this sets A sub N would be finite. So it is possible that uh, the content of the set X is infinity, but uh, it may be also possible that it is sigma finite uh, in the sense that I can partition or divide x into uh, portions a sub n in the semi ring wherein each a sub n have a finite uh, content. So um, as an example, let us consider the so-called elementary content on the set of real numbers. So again, uh, consider the collection I of all uh, half open, half close uh, intervals having uh, endpoints that are, uh, or having endpoints A less than or equal to uh, B. Let us define uh, the function kappa from uh, this collection I uh, as follows. Uh, so the value of uh, this uh, interval or this cell, okay, with respect to kappa is basically the difference of the endpoints. More precisely, it is the right endpoint B minus the left endpoint A. 
So we claim that the triple, so the set R, the collection of all our cells in this form and this function kappa is a finite content space. Okay. So to show this, let's see if the value of the empty set under kappa is zero. Well, the empty set is the interval, half open, half closed interval, zero to zero. Yes, there's no number greater than zero and at the same time less than or equal to zero. And by definition, this is the difference of the endpoints. Hence, uh, kappa of the empty set is zero. Next, we need to show that kappa is additive. Well, uh, to prove this, consider collection of intervals. finite collection of intervals that are pairwise disjoint. And we assume that these intervals are uh, non-degenerate, meaning uh, a sub k is less than b sub k because if they are equal, uh, then uh, according to the definition of kappa, uh, the value of that interval under kappa would be zero. And they will not contribute later in the sum. Also, we suppose that uh, these intervals are arranged in such a way that the left endpoints are increasing. So for each k from 1 to up to uh, n minus 1. Otherwise, you can just rearrange and rename the intervals. OK. Now, assume that the union of these intervals is in I. So this means that this is also an interval of the form AB. So let us look what is the situation that we have. Okay. So we have an interval AB. So this will be at the union of these intervals. So in this case, the first interval must be of the form, or in the first interval must be in such a way that a1 must be equal to a, and b1 is somewhere between a and b. Since this is the interval having the least left endpoint. The next interval, which is A2, B2, 
should be as follows. So A2 should be the same as B1, and B2 should be uh, somewhere in between A2 and B. And you continue this process until you get the last interval, A and B n, and in this case, B n should coincide with the left endpoint B, and A n should be uh, in this uh, region. So therefore, the above situation is possible only when so a must be equal to a1 but a1 is equal to b1 b1 is equal to a2 a2 is less than b2 and b2 is equal to a3 and so on and you have uh, a n here less than b n and this should be equal to B. Okay, so with that, we can now take the kappa of the union. And this is kappa of AB, okay, and we can write this by definition to be B minus A, and then we insert terms, this is equal to BN minus A1, from the fact that B is equal to BN and A is equal to A1. And we shall write this as BN minus AN plus BN minus one minus AN minus one until we reach the last Now, these are equal because these two coincide. The inner terms will cancel. Because uh, each point that you will see here appears as either the right end point or the left end point. So that, uh, con that those terms will cancel out. In other words, the middle terms here will, will cancel. And essentially we have Bn minus A1. So in summation, uh, so this is the sum of uh, B sub K minus A sub K. And of course, by definition, this is kappa of the interval a k b sub k. Hence, uh, the kappa of the union is equal to the sum of the kappas. And this proves uh, that kappa is additive. Therefore, kappa is a content. Now we will show that it is also, well, it is not finite, but is a sigma uh, fine. It is, uh, yeah, it is finite. Well, the fact that it is finite follows immediately from uh, the definition because the difference of two real numbers is again a real number.
let us write it here kappa of a b the definition this is b minus a is always a real number for any real numbers a b a less than or equal to b in fact uh, that a is less than or equal to b is immaterial in the difference because we know that uh, the set of real numbers is closed under uh, uh, the uh, is closed under subtraction. So that is our first example. The next example will be uh, the following. So let us consider a set X, uh, a centering H on X, and let us take a particular point in the set, say X. Then we define delta x as follows. So delta x of a is either 0 or 1. If x uh, is not an a, then it is 0. If x is an a, then it is 1. Alternatively, we could define delta x a as the characteristic for the integrator function of the set a evaluated at x. So indicator function of a. So x evaluated at the indicator function of the set is either 0, 0 if the point x is not an a, and it is 1 if, it, if the point is an a. OK, then in this case, the triple x, h, and delta x is a finite pre measure space. And these are called the Dirac pre measures. Concentrated at the point x. Well, later it will be clear that it is finite since it takes only two values, two finite values, namely zero and one. Okay, so let us verify that delta x is indeed a pre-measure on x. Okay. So what is the value of the empty set with respect to delta x? As we said, this is equivalent to the indicator function of the empty set evaluated at x, and this is 0 since the empty set does not contain any element, hence it does not contain x. Now, the next step is to prove that delta x is sigma additive. So to do this, let's start with 
a countable sequence, the elements in the summary, and it is pairwise disjoint. And that the union of these sets is also in the summary. So our goal is to show that delta x evaluated at the union must be the sum of delta x of each of the uh, sets in the union. So here, we expect that this series should be either 0 or 1. Because the right-hand side or the left-hand side is either 0 or 1. Let us consider two cases. What if x is not the union? Then, if x is not in the union, x is not in a n for any n. So that x must neither be an element of a sub n for any n. So in this case, delta x of the union, since x is not in the union, this is 0. And the sum is also 0 since each of these are all equal to zero. So that's uh, the first case. The second case, which is the negation of the first one, what if x is in uh, the union? Then, by assumption, the a sub n's are pairwise disjoint. Therefore, one can find a unique n such that x must be in this set a sub n and nowhere else. In other words, x is not in a n if n is different from n. In other words, x must be in one and only one of the sets in the sequence because the sequence are pairwise disjoint. So computing the sum, delta x of a sub n. Okay, everything here is zero except for the index n. So we can write this as the sum from n from one to infinity or we should write this simply as delta x of a sub n since delta x of a sub n is 0 for all n different from n. And this is equal to 1, since x is in a n. Since x is in the union, therefore, delta x of the union must be equal to 1.
and this proves additivity or sigma additivity to be precise for delta x. So you could see here uh, that the two cases, case one and case two, in fact corresponds to the values either zero or one. In case one, that is precisely when x is not in the union. And then the second case, that is precisely when x is in the union. So indeed, uh, this triple x, the semi ring h, and then delta x is a pre-measure space. And since delta x uh, takes values that is either zero or one, it is obviously finite. And that is for this lecture. In the succeeding uh, discussions, we will provide further properties of contents and pre-measures. And from this, we will construct or define uh, the so-called measure spaces. So see you then.